Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Princeton University Press Ideas Podcast, a joint production of Princeton University Press and the New Books Network. I'm Mark Clovis, and today I'm speaking with Max H. Bazerman, author of the book Complicit, How We Enable the Unethical and How to Stop. Max, welcome to the New Books Network. Thank you. I'm delighted to be with you. We're delighted to have you on our show. I was wondering if you could start us off by telling our listeners something about yourself. Sure. I'm a professor at the Harvard Business School, um, and I've been working on the topics of negotiation, behavioral economics, decision making, and ethics um, for multiple decades. And um, I'm particularly fascinated by the way in which people engage in and allow unethical behavior without any intentionality of doing anything wrong. It really is a fascinating subject that I I hadn't really thought about quite so uh, intensively until I read your book. What led you to write a book that focused specifically upon the subject of complicity? Um, It uh, goes back to January 6th. Um, 2021, um, a few, as of a few days before that, um, the topic wasn't even on my mind. And then the insurrection occurred at the U.S. Capitol, um, and it was a shocking event for so many of us. And I spent my time um, sort of observing how many different people had to be complicit and allowing the state of our political environment to get to the point where such a terrible event was even possible. So I became fascinated first with the insurrection and the complicity of so many politicians who stood by or encouraged such a terrible set of behaviors to occur. Um, I started writing a tremendous amount about the insurrection as well as collaboration during Nazi Germany. Um, I wrote up uh, many pages. I shared it with some close colleagues. Um, and many of them said, the topic's terrific, but people don't look to a uh, Max Bazerman business school professor to tell them about the instruction or the Nazi era. And they encouraged me to move in the direction of lots of other um, stories of wrongdoing. And as I looked at all the stories of wrongdoing that your listeners are familiar with um, in terms of the scandals that make it to books and to miniseries, um, I was stunned by the degree to which a, pa- a common pattern existed. And that is that there was a wrongdoer or a couple of wrongdoers in the middle of the story, but the number of people who were complicit with the harm doers was simply shocking. And um, complicit basically retells stories that um, your listeners have read about and heard about before, but from a very different perspective, a perspective that comes closer to all of the rest of us who have seen wrong occurring around us and yet haven't done enough to keep the bad behavior from unfolding. So complicit is um, a recounting of lots of stories of wrongdoing in terms of the complicitors around them. And it tries to identify the reasons why so many of us end up being complicit without any intention of being a harm doer um, ourselves. Now, you talk about this uh, issue of complicity. I was wondering if you could perhaps begin discussing it by distinguishing what it is that makes a person complicit versus, pay, say, an active participant. And, and where have you drawn that line in your case studies? Yeah, so it's, it's, it's not a perfectly fine line, but I'll do, I'll do my best to answer. So um, in, the, in, in, my, in this book, um, I talk about seven different profiles of complicity. And Two of those profiles are true partners, people um, who share the, the vision of the harm doer, and collaborators, people who intentionally focus, who, who intentionally collaborate with the evildoer in order to get something that they want in return. So I would think of um, Mitch McConnell and Lindsey Graham as uh, collaborators in the sense that they weren't after the white supremacist goals um, of many people who were courted the Trump administration, but they were willing to work with them in order to get what they wanted in return, whether it was uh, seats on the Supreme Court or other political advantages 
that they would um, value. So both true partners and collaborators um, have intentionality, and I think that um, they are sort of explicit in working with the harm doer to create to create evil. But um, the the book goes on and provides five other um, bases for people to, in, to end up as complicitors, where in all probability, these individuals aren't even aware that they're doing anything wrong. They wouldn't um, think of their actions as unethical because it tends to focus on what they didn't do rather than what they did do. So um, when we think about intentionality, we tend to focus on errors of commission, things that we do do. Um, but, um, but my book focuses significantly on errors of omission, where um, our failure um, to act has more to do with the fact of what we didn't do, despite the fact that we had hints or information that wrongdoing was going on around us. Now, I, I want to get a bit more into those categories that you describe of complicity. You, and you uh, begin, you, you go from talking about complicity in general to s talking about cases of obvious complicity. I was wondering if you could perhaps, uh, perhaps open up that part of the book by talking what you mean by, uh, by elaborating a bit upon obvious complicity and uh, maybe uh, the, the, what, the different categories you, you, you define in it. Sure. Um, so uh, um, if we think about um, the opioid story and specifically Purdue Pharmaceuticals who mismarketed their product leading to the, to the de deaths of just hundreds of thousands of people, um, when we look at this story in, in, in some detail, at the core of it, we find McKinsey providing them with advice along the way on how to turbo, uh, turbocharge their sales, how to get patients to take larger doses, um, how to create a more addicting experience. McKinsey is explicitly um, working with them as their partner in return for the fees that they're getting in return. Um, McKinsey is sort of simultaneously collecting um, fees from the FDA to regulate pharma while they're also working with Purdue on how to sell as many products as possible, certainly going beyond what would be ethical. So when we look at that kind of story, um, I see McKinsey as a true partner of Purdue Pharmaceuticals. Um, but we can look at other situations where um, there's less active involvement. So if we think about the Volkswagen story where, um, and I'm referring to the Dieselgate story where they were intentionally manipulating tests and as a result, um, polluting the air which would result in the deaths of many, many people. Volkswagen was sort of the core evil doer in this story. We could identify specific actors within Volkswagen, but we can also look at the um, unions who worked at Volkswagen and the lower Saxony government that should have been providing oversight. Um, and they simply didn't. They were perfectly happy for Volkswagen to perpetuate um, the deaths of many in return for um, jobs and economic stability. So, um, it, so I see them as collaborators as opposed to true partners because they want something different, but they work with the core harm doer in creating um, the harm. So th those are the two explicit intentional paths or profiles to complicity. One of the things I appreciated from that section of the book is it, 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 how it made me think about the different ways in which we can be complicit. You, you think of com uh, you know, complicity is is in itself, you know, something that you can identify, but then you're pointing out that there are degrees of it and, and how from that you get the sense not just of, you know, how complicit we are, but the ways in which we sometimes uh, it can excuse our complicity. And this is something that I think comes across a bit more in your second section on ordinary complicity, but it, but it does point out how, you know, it, it's not as simple as saying someone is complicit. The ways in which they do so either involve a active choice to to enable or to assist versus say uh the the, the passive choice of you know sitting back and doing nothing and 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 how you know that in it in, in itself you know it, it could be just as as damaging or or or, or just as uh, uh unfortunate 
Absolutely. So um, a, a, a significant portion of the book focuses on five ways in which we act with um, ordinary complicity. And I, I use the word ordinary there as a takeoff from the work of Mazreen Banaji and Tony Greenwald, who talk about or, ordinary prejudice, where people um, are um, uh, discriminate against certain groups of people without any intentionality of creating any harm. Um, and I use ordinary in a very similar way, people who are complicit without any intention of harm doing. And um, I identify different, five different forms of ordinary complicity, um, the first of which is benefiting from privilege. Um, many of us are in very fortunate situations where there are people around us who um, are doing something wrong, um, and we have access to that information, but we're indirectly benefiting from it. And as a result, we simply don't choose that issue to take up as a cause of concern. So um, one of my favorite examples, unfortunately, from my industry, um, universities, is the area of legacy admissions. Um, I believe that 25 years from now, when people look back at this time period, one of the sort of truly um, unethical um, patterns of behavior that we see in many elite institutions like my own is providing benefit in the admissions process to alumni, to children of faculty, to, to the children of wealthy donors. And, and these um, processes create lots of benefit in terms of donations and loyalty, but they also create um, unacceptable levels of discrimination. And yet I see many of us who might have children who might benefit from these policies to basically say, yeah, it's not a good idea, but they don't choose to speak up or to act on this topic. So when we benefit from privilege, too often we stand on the sidelines. Another kind of profile that I talk about is when we kind of accept false profits. And you could either think of Jim Jones um, from the People's Temple who killed his um, members um, by drinking the Kool-Aid, even though it wasn't actually Kool-Aid. But you could also think of um, Elizabeth Holmes at Theranos or Adam Newman at WeWork who created cultures um, that asked people to, to suspend their judgment um, and to simply see the new world that these leaders were creating. In fact, these were new worlds that were quite bogus in a wide variety of ways. Um, I think when leaders ask us to suspend reason and to follow faith alone, um, we want to ask questions about whether or not this is a healthy direction. Um, a third category of ordinary complicity is when we give too much deference based on authority and loyalty. And we could think of, you know, the, the sexual abuse stories from Penn State, from Michigan State, um, where well-known university leaders allowed, allowed subordinates to engage in the rape of children. And the loyalty to the institution kept them from acting even when they had pretty good information. We see the same story on Harvey Weinstein, um, the famous uh, producer who had assistants, agents, and, and, and other people who worked at Merrimax, basically facilitating his rapes of young actresses um, uh, along the way. Um, a fourth group is when we sort of just trust relationships and don't do enough due diligence ourselves. So uh, chapter seven of Complicit is a personal story where um, I'm the author, um, there were five, five authors and I'm, I'm the last of the five authors who published a paper in 2011 um, that by two, 2021 was revealed to be a, a fraudulent um, study. So basically my name is on a paper where the data was made up. Now I didn't make up the data, um, but I could have done more to prevent that publication from ever coming to pass. But rather I simply trusted others in ways that um, led me to neglect the appropriate due diligence that I need. So sometimes when we put too much trust in others without providing oversight, 
we can end up being complicit in the process. And finally, um, um, I talk about those in leadership positions who create unethical systems, who create systems that we can predict um, are going to lead to unethical behavior. And we could think about Congress um, allowing the current auditing system to exist, where um, auditors are hired by their clients, um, they're rehired by their clients, they sell their clients consulting services, and we ask independent auditors, and I would put the word independent in quotes there, to provide something that they're not capable of doing. That is providing an independent look at the quality of the books of the firm. Um, and when we create these unethical systems, we're creating a long pattern of unethical behaviors that we could predict in advance, either in terms of intentional unethical behavior from an economic analysis or from the unintentional behavior that we can get from a psychological analysis by understanding that when people have a vested interest in seeing data in a particular way, they're no longer capable of objectivity. So those are five different ways in which I think we're, we have we exhibit ordinary um, uh, ordinary complicity um, by benefiting from privilege, by accepting false profits, by accepting authority and loyalty, when we put too much trust in relationships, and when we participate in creating unethical systems. Reading it made me uh, uh, made me think a lot about how the the degree to which we also as a society in some ways excuse this complicity because we turn the complicit into victims because i was thinking of jim jones and how you you know, make a, a a very persuasive case for how you know jim jones could not have done everything he did by himself obviously he had these people who were helping him but we tend to treat them as either you know they were the ones who who drank the flavor aid and who who died or who were we we tend to excuse them as they were misled they were brainwashed you could say the same thing for like uh, uh, Elizabeth Holmes and Theranos that the Wal that the Walgreens executives were uh, uh, were, were basically uh, you know tricked or lulled and, and and that it's a way of, of of how we tend to give people who are complicit under ordinary complicity almost a pass you know Harvey Weinstein's assistants they were they were workers you know what what power did they have to do something about it we're, we're effectively saying to to that you know their behavior that we were excusing them of their complicity because we make them into somehow that they were victims as well on a different level. Um, um, terrific summary, um, Mark. But so, so let me just elaborate on a, a few of the things that you said. First of all, to fill in uh, to fill in a, a, a couple of details. So um, um, on the Theranos story, which was um, their their blood testing device that basically didn't work. Um, Walgreens, fearing that CVS would reach a deal with Theranos, um, reaches a deal with um, Theranos to put this equipment into their stores and to allow this equipment that didn't work to be used on actual patients. Um, and from my perspective, there was a complete lack of due diligence um, on the part of Walgreens. And I don't think that they were thinking about how do we harm our patients, but I think that when executives don't do the due diligence necessary to protect medical patients, then I think that they're complicit. But I think you have it exactly right that this occurs without any notion of evil doing. It's simply um, um, results from people get, getting blinded by the various psychological processes that I referred to earlier that lead to ordinary um, complicity. Um, so I, I think that the, the book, in, from my perspective, um, is no, the core goal is not to go back and blame lots of different people for the bad events that have happened in the past. Rather, the goal is to keep the reader um, from engaging in complicity in the future and to the people who are listeners who are leaders for, to keep them from creating organizations that are likely to lead to complicit behavior and to allow wrongdoing to perpetuate within their organizations. Um, you also sort of bring up sort of this, this interesting issue um, that, that, I, that I find to be true, that we tend to like a single source of blame. And if you think about any, pick your favorite scandal, and if I ask you 
what caused that particular um, scandal, you'll typically get a response that's very simple and focuses on a singular character. And in fact, I tested this with a group of executives at the Harvard Business School, where I asked them the question, what was the cause of the crisis at Theranos? And the vast majority of people responded with one answer, and that had to do with Elizabeth Holmes' unethical behavior. They didn't mention Sunny Balwani, the um, her the president of the company and her romantic partner, who was also guilty of has been convicted of, of being guilty of numerous frauds. They didn't mention the prestigious members of the board um, who sat around and didn't bother to notice that none of them had the medical expertise to evaluate um, the claims of Elizabeth Holmes. They don't mention Walgreens, um, who we alluded to earlier. So um, we, we tend to focus on single sources of blame. And what that does, it, it lets the complicitors off the hook um, from their role and allowing this behavior to, to occur. So complicity ends up being out of focus and we don't hold people accountable for their errors of omission. Um, we rather attribute the problem to the committing actor um, at, at the core of the scandal. And again, I don't mean to take these evildoers um, out of, uh, I don't mean to take blame away from these evildoers, but I want to highlight that to the extent that we could reduce complicity in our organizations, the harm doers couldn't get away with the harm that they're perpetuating. I'd like to uh, turn to something that you alluded to, which is the fact that you're not just talking about these case studies and pointing to these problems as a way of of, of just blaming people and criticizing. You're you're this is a book in which you're trying to make a, a, a constructive uh, uh, case to uh, finding ways of avoiding this in the future, ways of addressing this, ways of, of minimizing, if not outright eliminating, uh, complicity in society. I was wondering if you could perhaps talk about how uh, you you deconstruct the psychology of, of complicity and, and how that can point to some possible solutions for the future. Sure. So I think that we that there's um, a variety of ideas that we can sort of pay attention to. Um, I, I'm inspired by a woman by the name of Erica Newland, who I write about um, in the book, who worked in the Department of Justice during the Trump administration, and um, her office was specifically in charge of providing oversight of presidential directives. And um, she and and she certainly was not a sort of fan of Trump, um, but she thought that she could um, sort of provide um, limits on presidential power by staying in her job. But over time, she found the Department of Justice under the Trump administration to too often sort of justify his behaviors and put a rubber stamp um, on what he was doing. And after the um, dramatic shooting at the Tree of, Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, she basically said that um, her office was condoning um, presidential, President Trump's actions um, and that she could no longer be part of that um, system and she quit. Um, and the more you read about Erica Newland, the more you walk away thinking this is a really good person trying to do um, good things in the world. And if she was complicit, I think all of the rest of us need to look at the roles that we're playing in our organizations and think about what do we know about harm doing within our organization? And is there things that we could do to stop it? So by thinking about the different profiles that I talked about earlier, we can do a psychological audit of are there ways in which we are ourselves engaged in ordinary complicity. And that can motivate us um, to speak up more, um, to acknowledge our ethical blind spots, um, to take it as our job to not just meet the task requ requirements on the table, but figure out how to do our job jobs to create more good in the world, um, to perhaps talk to friends um, 
who might also be aware of the same things that we're aware of in our organizations. Because oftentimes people gain strength by talking to others in the organization who are observing similar patterns. And sometimes uh, people avoid complicity by coming forward together. So those are some of the things that I think that we can do um, to reduce the likelihood of being a complicitor in the future based on auditing the psychology that could lead us to our complicity to start with. Well, we appreciate the time you've taken to speak with us, but before we go, could you tell us what you're working on now? Sure. So um, first of all, um, uh, I'm happy to say that this is one of many um, podcasts that I'm doing um, on the book Complicit. So my number one focus um, in the month of November um, of 2022 is to get the word out on the book and also what all of us can do to be less complicit um, in the future. Um, so that's my, my core task. But um, obviously, that doesn't take up all my time. And I'm actually on I'm a sabbatical this year from, from Harvard. Um, so I, I do have time to write. And I'm working on another project, um, which I've signed with um, Princeton University Press, um, called The Game Has Changed. Um, and it's um, a book about negotiations. And it looks at how so many changes in the world from the globalization of the economy to moving transactions online change how we negotiate um, today in ways that are fundamentally different than 20 years ago. And I focus on how do we take a lot of the core frameworks that a lot of people know about negotiations and contextualize that to specific environments, including the global changes that surround us. Well, it sounds like a fascinating book. I hope that when you've uh, completed it, we can have you back on the podcast to discuss it. That would be delightful. Max, thank you very much for taking some time out of your schedule to speak with us. I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you. It's been a joy to be talking with you. 